Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Uh, welcome to today's uh, first of a series of webinar and workshops. Uh, today, we'll discuss the role of the private sector in the post-pandemic economic recovery in the Philippines. Um, in a bit, I'll turn you over to my colleague, uh, Pat, uh, who will introduce the speakers. Uh, but before that, let me say a few things. Uh, one is uh, thank you to our partners, Investing in Women, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Australian Embassy for making this uh, series of webinar and workshops possible. The two other workshops, uh, the two other events uh, will be on the 18th November, that's one, and another on the 25th uh, November. Focusing on gender lens investing, we'll, we'll have a workshop for that. And another deal share live session featuring women-led uh, enterprises. Um, a few housekeeping uh, uh, things to consider uh, before we start. Uh, one is you've got there down below a Q&A box. If at any point you'd like to send in a question, uh, please uh, do so. Uh, my colleague, uh, Diana Watson, who is in the background will collate your questions and articulate them for you when we reach the Q&A uh, segment. And then um, for uh, certain periods, uh, certain points uh, during the um, webinar, please anticipate uh, a poll that we will launch. And we'd really appreciate if you can uh, participate in those uh, polling uh, exercises. Um, this is all to keep the webinar interactive uh, this morning. And uh, once again, uh, let me welcome you to today's uh, webinar uh, discussing the role of the private sector in the post-pandemic economic recovery in the Philippines. Uh, your host this uh, morning is AVPN. Uh, we are a network of social investors and resource uh, providers with the mandate to move capital towards impact. Uh, my name is uh, Arnil Paras. I'm the country director for AVPN and a professor at the Asian Institute of Management. Pat, I turn over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Arnil. Well, let me set the scene for what promises to be an enlightening discussion today. A recent Asian Development Bank report noted that the Philippine economy is forecast to contract by 7.3% in 2020. Risks are tilted to the downside, the ADB report said, and the impact to the economy will be larger if the global outbreak is prolonged or if there is a sustained prolonged local transmission in the Philippines. This downside risk could weigh heavily on trade, investment in the country, as well as overseas Filipino worker remittances. Now the government and development banks have all taken steps to help in COVID-19 response, delivering a combination of loans and grants. In a special section, session, Congress enacted additional powers to enable the president to manage the crisis. The package of measures the government rolled out, such as income support to families, relief for small businesses, and support to agriculture all help the economy, but it is expected that recovery will be slow. Now, the private sector has also played a part in COVID-19 relief efforts with many of AVPN's members who are here today working tirelessly on relief and recovery efforts in the Philippines. For example, ABS-CBN Foundation has a COVID-19 relief fund with the aim to help 1 million needy families in Luzon. Globe Telecom is driving support to frontline health workers and hospitals through its FinTech platform. The Ayala Foundation is doing tremendous work with Project Ugnayan. Also the Lopez Foundation, and I know many of you are here. Uh, so thank you for the work that you're doing to help with the relief efforts in the Philippines. During the panel this morning, we will be joined by representatives from three organizations who are all active in the Philippines and working on initiatives around COVID-19 uh, relief and recovery. I invite the speakers to turn on their cameras now. I'm delighted to welcome Julia Newton Hose, CEO of Investing in Women, Sixto Donato Macasset, Executive Director from the Foundation for a Sustainable Society, and Lisa George, 
global head of the Macquarie Group Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to invite each of you to give a very brief introduction about your work. We could start with Julia, followed by Dodo and Lisa. Thanks very much, Pat, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted to be part of this important AVPN panel. My name is Julia newton House, and I'm the CEO of Investing in Women. That's a seven-year Australian government initiative to catalyze economic growth through women's economic empowerment across Southeast Asia. We have a focus on working in the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Myanmar. And we work across three areas. Firstly, on workplace gender equality. And in the Philippines, we work with the Philippines Business Coalition for women's empowerment. We also work with impact investors and by partnering with impact investors and ecosystem builders such as AVPN, we look to expand market opportunities for women with a view to incentivizing and catalyzing access to capital for uh, small and medium enterprises that are owned by or run by women. And finally, we're working with partners to shift those gender norms which limit women's economic opportunity. Thanks, Pat. Dodo? Dodo, you have to go off mute, I think. Sorry, sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Pat and uh, Arnel. Uh, I'm Dodo Makasayat. I'm the Executive Director of the Foundation for Sustainable Society, or FSSI. FSSI is a social investment NGO, which was founded in 1995 or 25 years ago. We have supported, uh, we, are, we are supporting social enterprises that pursue the triple bottom lines. And since we were founded, we have, we have supported more than 240 uh, enterprises all over the country. And we currently have around 70 active partner enterprises. So we provide financial and capacity building uh, services support to these uh, enterprises. Uh, we are a proud uh, partner of investing in women. We are one of the local fund managers of investing in women in the, in the country. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa George. I'm the global head of the Macquarie Group Foundation based in Singapore. I've been with the foundation for just over 10 years. Um, the foundation is the philanthropic arm of Macquarie Group, which is a global uh, diversified financial services group. Uh, we do asset management, uh, investment banking, uh, other types of capital solutions. Uh, since our inception, we've contributed over 410 Australian, uh, 410 million Australian dollars uh, to our philanthropic efforts uh, since we started. Just a little bit about our presence in the Philippines and why this is an important um, country for, for Macquarie. We've been in, in the Philippines for 15 years and the Manila office is our third largest office with almost a thousand staff across um, six business groups for us. Um, we, we run a number of businesses, uh, but we're one of the leading infrastructure asset managers in, in the Philippines. Um, managing assets such as wind and solar, um, you know, powering clean energy to, to households across the Philippines. So that's just a bit about us, thanks. Thank you. Now that we know a little bit about our speakers today, I would like to ask our audience what type of organizations they represent. I hear we have over 100 members in the audience today, and it's a, it's a nice, strong representation across audience with, I think, the largest coming from the nonprofit sector. Excellent, excellent. Let's now move back to our panelists. 
It seems that each of your organizations comes from a very different starting point, but shares a similar mission to make a positive impact in the immediate relief and recovery efforts in the Philippines. Julia, can you tell us a little more about the innovative initiatives your organization is involved in, in the relief efforts in the Philippines? Yes, thanks, Pat. And I'll focus on our work with impact investors. So back in March, we did a very early rapid assessment of the economic impact of coronavirus on SMEs in general, and particularly looked at the um, women's SMEs within our portfolio in Southeast Asia. And we found that women's SMEs within our portfolio were facing potential bankruptcy within a couple of months due to liquidity challenges, including plummeting revenues, along with things like broken supply chains, productivity issues, as countries went into lockdown. So we realized the urgency of a rapid response. If these companies that were fundamentally sound were going to be able to survive this intense period of disruption. Um, if we had to wait for six months for many companies, it would be too late. So we're conscious that governments and development finance institutions were and continue to develop um, fiscal and economic stimulus packages directed at businesses. But we also knew that women's SMEs may not automatically benefit from these initiatives. These financial and non-financial measures, whenever they've been launched, tend to gravitate towards traditional borrowers and risk reinforcing the gender biases in the financial services industry generally. And we know that women entrepreneurs really remain very underserved. So at Investing in Women, we worked closely with our fund managers to understand how their women SME portfolio was being affected and in response to what we learned, we launched the RISE Fund. So this inter intervention is to support uh, women's SMEs through two, um, and there's two parts to it. And um, firstly, access to emergency capital for um, strong companies within our existing portfolio. And then also a resilience um, fund um, which will fund investments into women-led companies with a positive growth outlook um, at this particular time of economic disruption. In the Philippines so far, we've supported four women-led companies um, that are providing essential services in the market. So for example, Bufaco is improving availability of medicines and food. For, customer, for its customer base, which is close to 7,000 families in Mindanao. In Advantage um, has supported the government of the Philippines to launch its official COVID information chatbot, Kira, um, for the Department of Health. So these companies are providing essential services, but they're also crucial for retaining jobs and contributing to economic recovery. So we intend to continue to provide capital to our local investment partners who aim to invest in a further eight to 12 high impact women led companies in the Philippines in the coming 18 months. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Julia. It's wonderful that the focus on women entrepreneurs and impact investing. Lisa, I've heard that Macquarie Group Foundation has allocated funds for relief work, but also to support the staff. Uh, yeah. Tell us more about your relief efforts. More, more about supporting staff charitable efforts uh, rather than our staff directly. So we, we had a number of responses as a, as a corporate. The first was we announced in um, the end of March, early April, a $20 million COVID relief fund, uh, which was going to be focused on first humanitarian relief, direct response, um, medical research, and then longer term economic recovery. Uh, and we're about $15 million uh, through allocating that fund. And, and we're still um, in the process of, of allocating some funds to economic recovery projects. And we all so um, offered flexible funding and changed a lot of the constraints uh, with our 
traditional grants that we already had. And then, as you mentioned, we had a, a, a fund for that our staff could access for the charity that they support, kind of more grassroots. These were really small grants, but they made a really big difference um, to the organizations that our staff were involved in. That was a million dollars. So specifically in the Philippines, our, our response was both humanitarian as well as um, in terms of economic recovery response. Um, we worked with the Ayala Foundation, which of course everyone will know, um, in, in funding some of their work um, in the humanitarian response. And then of course, in terms of economic response, our, um, uh, our investment into investing in Women Rise Fund, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about later. Lovely. And Dodo, you're representing the panel straight from the ground in the Philippines. The last time we spoke, you were in the middle of a typhoon. Uh, do share with us your relief efforts on the ground and uh, in supporting SMEs. Yeah, and we're, uh, we're unfortunately uh, about to be hit by another typhoon. Uh, yeah, so, so FSI, we well immediately after the lockdown in, in March, we provided a small grant to, uh, to support the efforts of a network of uh, urban poor organizations and NGOs. This network provided cash assistance to households who lost their income sources, uh, including jeepney and tricycle drivers, market vendors, and others. So this was a, a quick relief to, to respond to their immediate need at that time. And, and as, as, you, as you've said, Pat, there are many other relief efforts by by many other organizations uh, in the Philippines, both uh, big and small. Uh, for FSI, as uh, part of our relief efforts, we immediately granted a grace period of 30 days for all loan payments uh, from our partners due, during the lockdown. This, this was uh, before uh, the COVID recovery law uh, actually required this. Now, there was a COVID recovery law in the Philippines that was passed in uh, uh, late March. Uh, we also did a quick survey of our partner enterprises in late March, and this enabled us to know how the pandemic and the lockdown affected uh, these enterprises and the support that they needed. Uh, and based on this, we made available uh, business rehabilitation loans at uh, discounted interest rates uh, to qualified partner enterprises. Uh, we also saw the importance of uh, the ICT no? uh, because of the restrictions on travel and mobility. So we are providing uh, ICT capacity building support, uh, including the provision of equipment and training of small amounts uh, to support our, our partners, especially those that are micro and small uh, and have limited capacity in ICT. Uh, we have also been involved actually in focusing work together with other organizations, for example, uh, looking at uh, policy recommendations to the government's agriculture, recovery, and food security programs and budgets uh, as they try to craft programs to respond to COVID-19. Uh, well, finally, we saw the need uh, to support uh, MSMEs in general and our partners in developing their risk management and business continuity plans. Many of the, the micro, small, uh, medium, and the small enterprises actually uh, need to, to either improve or, or really start uh, their business continuity uh, plans. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, to our panel for sharing your insights on what your organizations are working on. With about 400,000 people infected, lockdowns, each of these efforts are extremely meaningful. But we've also heard a lot about COVID-19 pandemic having a long tail. Uh, it's therefore crucial that in addition to immediate relief efforts, organizations also address requirements for long-term economic resilience in the Philippines following the pandemic. So before I go to our panelists, uh, some audience opinions on what does economic resilience mean to you? Is it strong economic policies to support a range of stakeholders, private sector acting? Ah, interesting. Social development, particularly catering for SMEs. A 
Okay, so most of you uh, feel long-term economic resilience is really social development, catering for SMEs to protect communities and livelihoods. And that really sets up to the next section. Uh, the Secretary General of the Association of South Asian Nations had said, even if recovery is achieved, the post-pandemic world will not return to business as usual. Our world has been irreversibly transformed by COVID-19, and this calls for equally transformative responses. So Lisa, let me start with you. What do you think are transformative responses required to drive long-term economic resilience? Well, I think um, the private sector obviously has a, has a big role to play. I mean, in terms of economic resilience and recovery um, in, in any economy, including the Philippines. So the private sector has the ability to attract capital, to grow that capital quickly um, and, you know, create jobs and grow enterprises. So I think, you know, the whole economy stands to benefit. And, and in our case, you know, we're, we're also um, helping to manage really crucial infrastructure in, in, in a country like the Philippines as well that kind of keeps the country moving along on a, on a daily basis. Um, so, so, you know, the private sector has, the, has an important role to play. And I think, I think what's interesting for companies to think about in a post-COVID environment in particular is who's really being left behind. Um, you know, and I think, you know, in particular, uh, this grant um, that we, we made um, focusing on women, you know, and, and really understanding that women were the ones who were going to be really disproportionately affected, but also have the um, a disproportionate ability to um, help with economic recovery, I think, if, if supported in the right way. So for us, you know, this, this investment, what we loved about it was its multiplier effect. You know, this, this injection of capital is going to attract other investors. And again, I think that's the kind of role that the private sector can play, um, whether it's kind of in this, in this you know, um, more philanthropic way or, or in, a, um, in a more commercial sense as well. Um, that's interesting. Philanthropic and a more commercial uh, sense. Uh, Dodo, what do you think about that? And what are your views about long-term economic resilience? And I'll ask the audience to also keep putting in their questions in the chat box because we will carve some time at the end to have a discussion and uh, go to your questions at the end. But please keep sending in the questions through the discussion. Sorry, Dodo. Uh, thank you. Well, well, for us uh, in FSSI, uh, we, we see that the resilient future for the Philippines will have to be based on the triple bottom lines. Uh, economic recovery, certainly, but we also have to ensure positive social and environmental outcomes. Uh, COVID-19 is primarily a health concern, but it has brought with it major socioeconomic problems such as increased unemployment and poverty and reduced access to education you know, for many of our uh, youth. Uh, also, some responses to COVID-19 uh, bring with them environmental concerns, including increased waste materials from face masks uh, and packaging for take takeouts and deliveries. So we have to be conscious about that. Uh, there are around 860,000 MSMEs in the country, uh, but more than 90% of these are really micro enterprises. Uh, and only 9% are small enterprises. and only well, less than 1%, around 5,000 are medium enterprises. Uh, there are also very few large scale enterprises. For a, for, a, for a resilient future, we think that the private sector will need to more deliberately, uh, consciously include MSMEs in their supply chains, while at the same time treating them fairly and uh, strengthening them you know, in, in this relationship. Uh, we, well, well, part of our resilient future is uh, strengthening MSMEs and uh, well, loans and equity investments are necessary. Uh, a recent ADB survey, I think, showed that uh, of all the MSMEs in the country, only around 16% around applied for loans you know, because uh, well, others relied on their own capital or on loans from their, from their relatives or friends. Only around 15 or 16% applied for bank loans and only around 4% were able to access bank loans. Uh, this is not obviously not because they don't need uh, the funds, but because uh, they need additional capacity building and additional training, additional coaching 
to 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 make them uh, uh, capable and, and prepared. No? Uh, and this has to be addressed also. This is an important gap that should be addressed by government, CSOs, and and private uh, businesses uh, also. No? Uh, well. We also think that a resilient future in the country will, will need expanded and more effective social uh, protection measures you know, uh, that include, uh, that ensure people have access to food, health, and education services, uh, among others. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, a building a resilient future for the country will require that important inequalities are addressed, including urban and rural and interregional inequalities and especially now uh, the di digital divide uh, the, the inequality in access to to ICT uh, ICT uh, uh, technology and access to the internet yeah that's interesting dodo when you talk about interregional uh, connections because this economic jeffrey sachs had said the philippines must strengthen its cooperation with other countries to address the crisis so julia any thoughts on what you've seen in other markets that can be reapplied in the Philippines or work from the Philippines that you think could be taken to other markets? Well, I, I would like to just um, briefly say that I think there are two critical things for the private sector. And I think this does apply across the region. Um, and I'll briefly mention that um, in a moment, but firstly, the private sector itself will be more resilient and build faster economic growth by adopting a clear commitment to workplace gender equality within companies themselves. So I know in the Philippines, um, there's a lot of pride and rightfully placed in the level of gender equality in Philippine society. Um, but nevertheless, there's a lot of inequality still in the Philippines economy. Female workplace, workforce participation is around half that of, the, of male workforce participation. And women are really badly underrepresented at CEO level and at board level. Um, and the workforce is quite segregated. Gender equality in the private sector drives greater innovation, it drives better risk management, it drives greater profitability. So I do want to make a big push for workplace gender equality as part of any commitment to COVID recovery. But secondly, um, drawing on the work that we're doing with the Macquarie Foundation um, and FSSI, I would like to say that foundations, philanthropists, impact investors, are critical actors in helping to build resilience for communities. Impact businesses can lay the groundwork for rebuilding an inclusive um, and equitable economy. Um, I think across the region, we can see that the majority of impact capital is coming from the global north. Um, and we really do believe that there's a lot of local capital that can and should be looking closely at impact investing. Um, so in, as part of that, I would like to also pitch for a stronger collaboration between uh, donor, government donor work and the private sector. Um, and I think, you know, we can see that something like investing in women one, we absorb some of the risk of initiating these types of activities. We've also piloted and set up and proven a model for impact investing in Southeast Asia. And we're delighted then that the private sector through the Macquarie Group Foundation will come and invest into this model with us. Um, and I think that Macquarie, the Macquarie Group is helping expand what is a proven model of working. And I think this you know, this is an, an initiative that we hope, you know, others will notice and do more of. You know, across the region, um, uh, COVID impacts are enormous. Um, they vary depending on the extent to which um, governments have been able to really control the virus. Um, but with, you know, a lot of uh, export oriented economies, uh, there is a lot of pain in uh, across the region. So, you know, the SME sector is going to be critical for recovery, both in the Philippines and more broadly. Thanks, Pat. No, you're right. You're right. This is clearly not just a health crisis, but an economic and social crisis as well. And uh, 
it's affecting women disproportionately. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to again check with our audience. What kind of opportunities or support would you like to have to help enhance your organization's work in building inclusive, inclusive economic stability? Are you looking for partnerships? Yes, many of you are. Are you looking for opportunities to invest directly in SMEs? Or are you looking for learning opportunities, case studies, data on what's working in this space? Okay, so the audience feels partnerships to work in collaboration on recovery and resilience projects. That's good to see. I think sometimes from crisis comes uh, opportunities to come together and collaborate some more. Uh, and it looks like the audience is feeling that way. Now moving to our third section. Uh, there is enough of data, enough of reports, enough of research to show that women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic from whether it be a social, a health, or an economic perspective. Uh, women entrepreneurs were particularly already disadvantaged compared to their male counterparts. And we've heard initiatives that apply a gender lens and the economic social benefits of doing so. So my question, what would be your advice to the private sector on how they get started, on how to integrate this gender lens within their organization if they're not already doing so? Maybe we start with Dodo, uh, with your experience uh, on the ground, Dodo, and follow up with uh, Julia and then Lisa. Thank you, Pat. Yeah. Well, well, in, in our experience, uh, as I, I mentioned before, it is uh, many of the women social enterprises, uh, women MSMEs, and, and MSMEs in general, uh, need uh, capacity building, still need capacity building. Uh, to be able to, they needed, it, they needed it before the pandemic and especially now, now with the pandemic. So uh, coaching and capacity building and incubation programs are, are I think, very important. And, and the, survey, the polls showed that there's a need for, the, the people appreciate the need for collaboration. And uh, the, 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 even in this incubation capacity building programs, there's a need for collaboration among the different actors that support uh, in uh, impact investments that support social enterprises, and and there have been a number of uh, actor in initiatives in the in the Philippines recently uh, towards this, no? and and these are important. Uh, in, well, in terms of how the private sector can support uh, women social enterprises, I, I I'd like to go back to what I mentioned and 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 about. About the about the private sector, private business involving including uh, MSMEs and women social enterprises uh, in their in their supply chains more deliberately, more consciously, and even if this means uh, some trade-off uh, in terms of uh, cost and speed, especially at the start. No? Uh, uh, there was one project recently uh, uh, by some CSOs that involved. Uh, uh, asking or, or supporting local eateries, what we call carinderias, to provide uh, food assistance to urban poor families, no? and 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 that was uh, that was uh, that involved some some effort in terms of strengthening the health and sanitation standards of these eateries. No, so so along the way, as you build up on on these uh, social enterprises, MSMEs, uh, necessarily there would be some trade-off. No, you could work more easily, more quickly, maybe at less cost with your usual, usual supply and chain partners. But there has to, we think now is the time for, for, for private business to be more deliberate and more accepting of, uh, the, of uh, the need to strengthen uh, social enterprises, including women social enterprises. Uh, well, well, in general, I think we, we, we think that uh, private, the private sector has to be strengthened there. This is a time to strengthen their environmental and social policies and practices, including their gender policies, 
as we attempt to recover or as, as we are recovering uh, from this pandemic. Thank you, Dodo. Julia, what are your advice for the private sector on their gender policies? Well, first of all, I'd like to ask everyone to reflect on this fact that we know that intelligence, skills, business acumen, good ideas are equally distributed across our society. They don't depend on, on your race or your gender. And so 50% of the good ideas that, that, and the good businesses out there are coming from women. Nevertheless, women and men have different life experiences and the types of businesses they set up are often different. But the finance sector, which remains male dominated, is more likely to fund men than women. And so our economies are missing out on growth and an important range of female owned and led businesses. So this is an important gap that our economies will be much stronger if, if we fill. So, um, and whilst, you know, we funded a recent study by IntelliCap looking at impact investing across Southeast Asia, and this shows that there is a growth, a significant growth in gender lens investing in Southeast Asia, but really the volumes remain tiny. So what we, what we need to do is grapple with a system, systematic, systemic challenge. This isn't an operational challenge. There's a huge gap in market capital for, gen, for a gender smart response to COVID-19. You know, the OECD recently published a policy review of SME policies, um, both in emerging economies as well as developed OECD countries. And the gender allocation of funds for women-led businesses was, was missing. It's just a big gap. So I really recommend that the private sector just remember these facts and embeds gender at the core of their business and investment approach. And that does require you to really interrogate your networks, how you operate, um, and watch your systematic biases within your company, how they might arise and where they are. Um, I also want to ask capital providers, investors, shareholders, we can all use our clout to demand change. No matter where you are in the system, encourage the adoption of gender smart policies, include women more fully to unlock the latent potential of the Philippines economy. Thank you. Oh, well said, uh, Julia. Lisa, what's your advice to the private uh, sector? How can they become very hard, very more hard inclusive? <laughs> and, and we're honestly just at the beginning of this journey. So I don't want to be uh, handing out advice as a, as a novice, really. This, is, this was, you know, one of our first um, forays in this, into this area. And as I said, because we recognize, you know, the disproportionate impact on, on women. What I would say is I would say keep an open mind and, and really just, just start talking to others who, who have taken this approach and, um, and just take a first step, whatever, whatever that might be, whether that be within your own company, your supply chain, as, as Dodo, you know, rightly said, one of the things we're thinking about you know, we've given funding to this initiative, but how can we leverage other resources um, more broadly? We're, we're a company, we have, you know, assets that we manage, we have suppliers, we, you know, potentially could, um, you know, some of these enterprises that these women are running, we could potentially procure services from them. So we're, we're thinking about uh, additional ways that we can um, leverage our funding uh, on top of what we're already doing. Very good, very good. Um, we have have a few questions from the audience and I think linked to what you said, Lisa, let's start talking to each other, let's take the step. And so I'm just gonna look into what are the questions that have come in and let's spend maybe a few minutes to address the questions and have a little discussion based on what's on the mind of our audience. Uh, so here's a question, how do you, each organization connect to others to leverage the resources to help the community? And how do you develop the ecosystem around your work? How can we start? Well, I can, I can, I can no, kind no. of build on my, my previous points, you know, which is to say as a, as a corporate, and I think those 
those on the call that are, you know, from the private sector, I think we have tremendous re additional resources that you can bring to bear. Um, so for in our case, our employees are a big um, natural resource that we have, uh, talent, their talent, their expertise, uh, that we you, we often try to leverage for the benefit of the the grants that we're making in the foundation. We are with these economic recovery grants that we made um, or and are making. We are doing it very much in concert with our businesses and think and talking to them and saying, you know, are there ways that you can get involved in what we're funding through the foundation? Because we don't we we want it to be a you know, a multiplier effect um, beyond just the funding that we're providing. So we're really thinking about um, how their networks um, and uh, how they can they can help amplify the impact. Could I just add something from the investing in women perspective? So we're four and a half years into a seven year project. And I think how over that time we've gone about it, is really to um, experiment, to tell the stories of how we've partnered with different groups over that time and build a sort of convincing case studies of what works and why and how. And um, so we have partnered now with 10 different impact investors um, and to work across the region. But importantly, by partnering with groups like AVPN, this is an opportunity, I think, to tell the stories of, of those partnerships and what works. And we're always happy. I mean, it's not really about investing in women telling that story. It's about the partners telling the story, because I think finding forums where impact investors can speak to impact investors about why and how to effectively do gender lens investing is, um, is part of what we've sought to do through, through our work. Mm -hmm. well, well, Douglas, there's a question that's come for you, so maybe we can uh, go to that. They said that mm -hmm. you spoke about the risk that some immediate relief efforts do not consider green or sustainable con considerations in their initiatives. Can you elaborate more on how you are integrating positive environmental factors into FSSI's work? Well, uh, uh, thank you, Pan. Uh, in, in normally, in, in regular pre-COVID times, and, well, uh, and even up to now, we've always uh, used uh, in our appraisal of potential partners and potential projects, We've always included uh, looking at the environmental, aside from the social and the economic uh, uh, aspects of the project. So that's part of our regular work. You know? uh, now, in, 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 during this pandemic, uh, we, it's actually quite a challenge because uh, uh, we have, there's a, well, I, I mentioned the, 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 the face mask and packaging because of the deliveries which are which are needed now because we want to maintain uh, safe distancing and we want to work from home and so on uh, so that's really a challenge but uh, uh, we try to we, 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 and we don't have any specific major major solutions at this time but I think we need to start with the consciousness that this this is a problem it's it's solving a problem but it's also causing it's also causing a new, a new problem we have to work on how to well, well uh, re, uh, recyclable packaging would be the quick answer, but it has its uh, cost and its uh, drawback. So, so we need to look for uh, solutions to these problems. But it has to start from recognizing that there is this problem that's brought about by, by that. Oh, well, let's take another question then. This one's interesting. For in gender equality, how could we have more women also in the army, police force, in hard labor, in cargo, construction work, not just promoting their positions in the C-suite levels. I, I mean, I think we see a lot of data about women on boards, women in the companies. How can we get more gender equality where other jobs are concerned? I'm happy to start off on that if, if that's okay. Um, I think, Desegregating the workforce is is hard. I mean, everywhere there are segregate people have this vision that that job is suitable for a man and that job is suitable for a woman. 
So actually we're partnering with um, a number of groups in the Philippines and one of them is education.ph, which is an online education platform to really highlight um, you know, men working successfully in traditionally feminized um, career paths and vice versa, women working as welders or in technical um, roles to try and break down those barriers. Um, but I, I think the other thing is, actually we also need to look at some of the data. Um, it was interesting, um, I, I hope I'll accurately reflect the story, but about three years ago when the elite forces in the Philippines um, took women, um, it, women in for the first time, I think something like eight of the top 10 graduates that year were female. So, I mean, we actually need to pay attention to the success stories that come when we do break these gender barriers um, and, uh, and the strength that um, gender desegregation um, brings to the economy. It's, it's a great question. And we all need to contribute to that by the way we talk to our children and our brothers and sisters to encourage um, new ways of thinking. Isn't that interesting? So much of it actually, so much of the bias is in our own minds uh, versus necessarily in the opportunities that are provided. Um, does anybody else want to weigh in or we can move to another question? Um, maybe we just take the next question which is, what do you think should be done for impact investors, social financiers, commercial funders to increase their efficiency? Hold on, hold on. I just lost the question as I was reading it. Yeah, uh, what should be done for impact investors to increase their efficiency and delivery timely financial and technical assistance to MSME? Let me repeat that again. What do you think needs to be done for impact investors, social financial, commercial funders to increase their efficiency and deliver timely financial and technical assistance to MSMEs? Dodo, you're the most directly best place to answer that. But let me start off by just saying the investing in women model is a sort of capital plus model. So we are providing funding for, um, you know, direct in, you know, to invest in, in women's SMEs. At the same time, we um, provide funds for technical assistance and also, you know, for the um, WSMEs, women's SMEs, and also technical assistance to build the capacity of the impact investors that we work with in areas that they see they need to have the, that, that investment, uh, that um, you know, capacity built. So that you know, we're, we, we really want to bring out the best in the partners that we work with. Um, so yeah, but I, I'm sure Dodo has a lot of real yeah. world. Well, I was thinking that's actually a real, real challenge, uh, even before the mobility restrictions came in and especially now no, with, the, with, this, with all these restrictions on travel uh, for example we've not been able to go to the field to, to actually visit our enterprises and we have to now rely on uh, online communications no, at least for now uh, but well uh, thinking about that I think uh, uh, one important thing that we've learned especially now because of the mobility, mobility restrictions that it's a Important to have uh, local local support networks also, no? uh, uh, as as near as near the enterprise as possible, so that uh, uh, the the back and forth is uh, facilitated even with problems. Uh, uh, well, for example, we're based we're based in Metro Manila, and for the past nine months, we've basically been restricted to Metro Manila, but our partners are. All over the country in Mindanao, in the Visayas, and in, in in various parts of Luzon. So we and we've had to rely on online communication, which does which does not work efficiently at all times or in, in most times because of weak, the weak the weak signal the, the, and all, all and all those problems. So, 
so, so yes, it's, it's, that's a challenge, and 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 having people as close to the enterprise as possible is uh, important, uh, and 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 well, improving ICT as I've already mentioned twice. I think improving our capacity to communicate online uh, is uh, is also quite important. Right. right. No, you're right. Uh, these crazy times make some of this even more challenging. And from that kind of challenge, uh, here's another question on a different kind of challenge. And maybe Lisa, you can uh, take this question. It says that COVID-19 had an impact on the private sector itself, when some cases, large businesses had to close resulting in major job losses. What should private sector organizations do to make themselves more resilient to crisis that will prevent large scale job losses in the future? That, that's almost an impossible question to answer. I mean, COVID has been such a shock, an unexpected shock that I don't think, you know, and no sector has been has been um, left untouched. And, I, and I, I'm really not sure that, you know, there was much that, that people could, could do. I think, you know, the last crisis that, that the financial sector faced showed that, in, you know, increased capital requirements and um, liquidity was was required for banks and that's you know serving us well in this in this crisis but again you know I think this is one of these things where government sorry there's some loud loud works happening outside um, and this is one of those probably cases where government monetary and fiscal policy is really required to step in um, mm -hmm. on a large scale I mean I'm, I'm probably out of my depth you know, saying anything more more than that, really. Um. Yeah, I, I, you're you're right, and that's interesting. The role of government uh, and working together with the government, even as a private sector. Well, maybe we have time for one last question, and this is a question for all panelists. There is more openness to collaborate now. How can we leverage on this window of opportunity? Are there concrete ways we can work with speakers in your organizations? So if there's somebody in the yeah. audience that wants to work with your organization, what do you suggest? Well, uh, in broad, broad terms, uh, I think uh, and we will need uh, support in terms of uh, capacity building for organizations, so trainers, coaches, uh, uh, technical support, for example, in strengthening their, their organizational, financial, and uh, communication uh, capacities would be very much uh, welcome. Uh, and we're, we're, we're here in Quezon City, so you can, and we have, uh, you can get in touch with that. We'd certainly welcome all the support that you can get, and then we'd, we'd be very open to working with others, uh, mutually supporting each other so that we can work to, to strengthen uh, MSMEs and, 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 and speed up this recovery uh, from the pandemic. Thank you, Dodo. Um, I, I, you know, we've been really, um, especially during this period, very keen to speak to other funders and other corporates in terms of their response. You know, it's been a learning period for everyone. Um, so, and, and we've been particularly grateful to AVPN for providing a platform and connections. So I think, you know, I would just encourage people to continue to, to leverage the AVPN network um, to, to, you know, continue the collaboration as we have. Yeah, and from our perspective, we, all our work is through local partners and um, so, uh, and we love to learn from others and to share our learning. So I agree with Lisa, I think the AVPN and other networks like that provide a really important forum, but we, um, we're interested in experiences that, uh, you know, will help, uh, we can help build your work and vice versa. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. And what a nice note to close on. Uh, leverage networks, reach out to each other, take one step at a time. We're in this crisis together. Um, and don't forget to be inclusive in all the solutions that you're uh, thinking of. But before we uh, wrap up, maybe I'll ask the speakers for 
one sentence, one last thought that you want to leave the audience with, one piece of advice, one piece of inspiration. Um, let's start with maybe Dodo. What's the one sentence you want to leave the audience with as we wrap up this panel discussion? Actually, I had two sentences. Uh, uh, the, 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 good. Good. Yeah, the, well, I think the private sector should work with and support MSMEs and social enterprises and women enterprises so that our COVID response strengthens these enterprises as well. Uh, now more than ever is the time to work together to ensure that the recovery from COVID-19 is speedy, inclusive, equitable, empowering, and environmentally sustainable. Speedy, inclusive, equitable. Thank you, Dodo. Lisa. Um, I think what COVID-19 in this period has really shown us is how flexible and adaptable we can all be as individuals, as organizations. And I really I would encourage us all to continue to embrace that flexibility and, and adaptability and, and you know, take that into thinking about new ways that, that we can make a contribution um, in, in the post-COVID era. Thanks, Lisa. Flexibility, adaptability. And Pat, I would say that the moral imperative for investing with a gender lens is now matched by an equally compelling financial and economic case. So wherever you are in the capital spectrum, allocate capital with a gender lens and acknowledge the contributions of women in, in building an inclusive and resilient society. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Uh, inclusive, res resilience. Well, after all, women belong in all places where decisions are being made, right? Wonderful. Well, we've had great pieces of advice that we can all take forward and truly make a difference. And, and the world requires that we all step up and uh, do our share to make that difference. I have definitely learned a lot from all three of you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on this panel. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Dodo. I'd like to hand over to my colleague Arnel now for his closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, a wonderful job in keeping all of us uh, on time. Uh, that gives me exactly two minutes and I have no intention to fully consume two minutes. Uh, but uh, just to say that the keywords that I keep on hearing um, in, this, uh, in this panel of eminent speakers is uh, one is uh, inclusivity and certainly that has a gender angle and I'm glad that uh, Julia uh, made uh, a case for why uh, gender lens investing is key to making this moral imperative a practical advice. Um, and, and Lisa and uh, Dodo from their respective organizations, I, I think uh, bring that kind of moral imperative uh, to groundwork uh, level in, in moving capital towards, uh, towards impact and in particular supporting social, uh, women-led social enterprises or in general, in general women-led enterprises. Um, on that note, in fact, um, as I mentioned in, at the opening, um, this forms part of a series of uh, webinar and workshops. Uh, in fact, uh, following this week, we have another next week uh, on the 18th of November. And if my colleague can launch that uh, last slide just to show our audience. Um, while she is doing so, let me highlight these two dates. Oh, there you go. Um, on the 18th of November, uh, that's Gender Lens Investing um, in the Philippines. There's an interactive workshop um, and we shall send you the links uh, in case you'd like to be part of this uh, event. And for the last week of November on the 25th in particular, a showcase of women-led enterprises in the Philippines. This is aligned with uh, some of the questions that have been asked by the audience. Uh, one is uh, how can they further the work of uh, gender parity in their workplace and in driving capital? So that's perfect for you if you have that question on the 18th. Um, 
And if the question you had was, uh, where else can we find these amazing women-led enterprises? Well, then we've got the 25th of November for you. Um, with, uh, with that, let me thank the panel members, uh, Julia, Lisa, and Dodo, uh, and of course to you, Pat, uh, the head of uh, gender platform of AVPN, and to the rest of our panel, uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. And uh, I 